Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the MindFit Movement podcast. Today, I have uh, the one and only Bobby Ann Poulton uh, on the show. Um, Hi guys. What's up? What's up? Hello, Melbourne. Yeah, so Bobby's in Sydney. Um, Bobby, we met on Instagram, which is pretty, yeah. pretty random, How? pretty cool though. I mean, how awesome is technology nowadays? Thank you, internet, for bringing people together. That is one of the huge positives of social media. Oh, yeah, totally, totally. So Bobby is a human optimization coach. Um, is that right? Yeah, that's perfect. Sweet. Um, <laughs> so do you want to elaborate a little bit more um, on what, what you kind of do in the world and what gets your juices flowing? Yeah, definitely. Um, hi guys. So yeah, I am a human optimization coach. I mean, there's loads of phrases we can throw around nowadays, but um, I guess you could say I'm trying to help you optimize your life. So I've been coaching on and off for 11 years now, and um, I've always looked at using those three pillars of health. So nourishment, movement, and mindset. And I just try and take all of those three together and optimize your life. Yep. So I work online. I work as a coach physically, I work, work as a coach mentally, work on your mindset, and then I help you spiritually as well. So bringing all those together. That's so cool. I love all of it. I love all of it. It is freaking cool, isn't it? I love what I do. <clears throat> and it's fun to do, right? <laughs> so, oh my God. So fun. What were they telling me at school when they were like, you need to be a doctor and a lawyer. Fuck that. This is way more fun. <laughs> yeah, totally. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. what I'm, and what I'm doing now compared to what I thought I had to do and what I ended up doing is completely chalk and cheese opposite. Oh my opposite ends. God. And it's scary, you know, like it's terrifying to think, well, some people like, like me and you had to work hard to be here. We've had to go through our own journey and figure out what we want to do and heal and go through our, our challenges. But some people are just born into you know, an unforgiving circumstance and they have yet to have their moment of clarity or their moment yeah. of kind of transcendence. And they're just like, well, I'm going to wake up, go to work, come home and be miserable. Uh, it doesn't actually have to be like that. Yeah, exactly. So um, you talk about a journey. Um, so you currently reside in Sydney, clearly, yep, clearly not born in Sydney with your, <laughs> with your beautiful English accent. Yes. Yeah. So, no, I'm born in Sydney. If we, if we retrace some steps, how did you end up in Sydney and kind of, you know, like what, what was your journey um, when you say that you kind of, there was a turning point in your life and what were you doing before and then, and kind of what has led you up to what you're doing now? Mm. Okay, so I am from a little town in the UK called Bristol or just outside Bristol, I'm like a country bumpkin really. I had an awesome upbringing. I was like really sporty. I was riding horses before I could even walk. Um, you know, I lived on a farm, we had land, I was eating mud pies, I was climbing trees, just a classic tomboy, I guess. Mm. <laughs> and, um, and that definitely impacted me because I've always been into sports and my parents divorced when I was young. So I was surrounded by male influence, uh, my brother and my dad, because my dad took custody. Okay. And so I just used sport as my kind of guidance to get me to where I wanted to be because it was where I could excel. I never kind of aligned with traditional education systems and it just didn't support my learning style. So having played sport, played rugby, went to uni, um, I rebelled loads as you can imagine. And um, I actually was from an area where as a child, we were quite sheltered. It was, it was quite a, how do I say, conservative, I'm going to say predominantly white British aristocratic type area. So, for example, I didn't see a, a black person, I said, until I was 14 years old. And, um, and I know it sounds ridiculous now, but I really had no idea of what travel was or other cultures. And I was just, mm -hmm. I guess, brought up in quite a narrow-minded um, society. And, mm -hmm. and and I mean, like, we we were... We had an awesome upbringing within that, but there was no kind of take the blinkers off and see what else is there. And my first, my first glimpse of this was I met a, I met a, 
uh, a boyfriend, a partner at university in Hong Kong or in the UK. And he was from Hong Kong. He was an expat. Okay. And um, he still lives in Hong Kong now. We're, we're friends. He's awesome. And um, so he was like, come visit me in Hong Kong. And I was like, where's that? Japan? Like literally had no <laughs> idea. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I got on a plane. This was when I was like 18, just to go and visit for like a holiday. Holy shit balls. I was like, this is insane. There's seven people in front of me from seven different countries and they're not scary. They're not gonna bite my head off. They're all yeah. friends. This is awesome. Oh my God, the food's insane. It was like literally a like, holy shit moment. I don't belong in England with all the people that are around me. And I just felt from that moment that I need to be out of the UK. It just wasn't supporting me at that time. And then from there, I went back home and was like, dad, I'm going to go live in Hong Kong or abroad. And he was like, what? And I was like, yep, yeah, I've decided. How, like, how old were you? I was 18, 19, 18, okay. 18, turning 19. So I still had two years left of uni. Right. And um, so I did it. So I finished uni and um, I was still with the partner at the time who was from Hong Kong. And so I was like, I've actually got a really crazy story if you want to hear how I actually got to Hong Kong, but it might take like three minutes. Go for it. <laughs> um, okay, I love so crazy I was traveling. Stories. I was traveling. So, in between my final year of uni, I went traveling around Asia, the classic OER. Got a stupid Chang tattoo on my ankle because everyone's <laughs> down when they're 18. Yes, I had beer tattooed on my ankle. I agree. I know it's ridiculous, but anyway, I was traveling and you know, do you know Macau? So Macau is like the Las Vegas of Asia. So okay. it's like this island, I think it's Portuguese run, it's full of Chinese mainlanders and Portuguese people. And it's this weird country off the coast of Hong Kong, which is it's completely separate entity. You need a passport to get in it because most people haven't heard of it. And yeah, it's right. just a fucking strip of casinos because it's illegal to gamble in China, that's why. Mm. So I went there with my best friend, Rachel Cab, I call her Cab for short. And, um, Anyway, it's one of those places where no rules, just like Vegas, I'd imagine. So no rules. We're in, we're gambling, we're drinking, we're absolutely lashing. And um, we meet these two guys who are like older, they're like 45 Kiwi guys. And we were just like young, dumb 18 year olds, right? And um, they were like betting big table. I was drunk, man, at this time. I had no responsibilities in my life apart from that time. So I was just doing what, what I wanted to do. <laughs> and um, they were like giving us chips, we were betting, and just like, you know, innocent. And then it turned out that the one of the pairs was the owner of the, or you no, know, deputy principal, I believe, of the Auckland School of Massage. And I was just finishing my studies in sports rehab and conditioning. And um, couldn't believe it, because that's like an awesome school. I think it's like a chiropractic school or, hmm. or like a school for like a uh, sports massage and clinic anyway and um he was like you know 3 a.m see you later never gonna see again he's like here's my business card if you ever want a job give me a call forgot it the other guy that was with him was one of the owners of a huge racing stables and my friend had just completed her degree in equine dentistry i know it's ridiculous what dentistry anyway both equine so horse dentistry oh what the fuck so the two people we meet he owns a racing stud and the other guy was like working at this chiropractic school that I was like really interested in so I was just finishing my undergrad anyway one year goes by I forget about it go back to uni do my studies I know I want to live in Hong Kong or abroad me and my friend one day are like fuck it let's email these guys so we go rummaging through our old like you know travel bag with the shitty tags you've picked up from every country and shit I don't know I'm lost traveler bands that we tie around our wrists which still <laughs> <laughs> anyway we send these emails and I shit you not they're like, we've got a job going as like an electoring assistant. Interview, blah, blah, blah. I get the fucking job. What? And he's like, he's like, I'll pay for your flights. You're going to fly via Singapore. You're going to come live in Auckland. And my friend reaches out to the other guys. We meet them. We've met them like 18 months ago in a casino on a drunken night out. And then they offer her like a, a job. I can't remember studying with equine or something like that. Anyway, we both get these jobs from these random people we've met in a nightclub. But um, unfortunately, what happened was I flew to Hong Kong to transit there and I never left. So. Ah, because I was like, hang on. How the fuck? She was going to New Zealand, yeah. but ended up in Hong so, Kong. And I've still never made it to New Zealand. I will do. But I ended up staying in Hong Kong. I just took a chance. I thought, you know what? 
if I can make it here, I can make it anywhere. So I stuck it out. Yeah, sweet. So um, you are in the CrossFit world. Um, how did you yeah. how, how did you find CrossFit and kind of when did that come into your life? Was that in Hong Kong? So, uh, not so. My first introduction to CrossFit was I was in my last year of university and you know, desperate times when you realize you've missed every single 6 a.m. lab and every single 9 a.m. lecture. They come to me and they say, Bobby, you've got to do, you know, 100 hours of work experience placement. And I'm like, fuck, I've literally done nothing. So I'm calling up all of the clinics, all the physio clinics, all the places where I'm supposed to be. So I was doing um, like sports rehab, like, like exercise fears here. Nowhere would take me. So the last place I'm like, what is this CrossFit gym in Cardiff? So I call them up and it's called Dragon CrossFit. They're still there now. They're, they're doing really well. The coach, I think coaches for some of the uh, CrossFit Games athletes, Jamie Green and that. I might have gone mm. wrong. Um, don't quote me. And uh, anyway, I walk into this gym and I'm like, what the fuck is this? Like, I'm coming from a background where like rehab, strict strength and conditioning, like mm. kip, what's kipping? You know, what are these mm. crazy people flapping around on there? Anyway, <laughs> so that was my first introduction. But all I knew was everyone was freaking strong as hell. Everyone was shredded. And the girls had thighs that were huge, but looked freaking awesome. And I was like, I mm. like this. Mm. Anyway, I did my hours, watched a few classes, get coached, didn't really think anything of it. And then never went back, moved, moved to, like forgot about it, just moved to Hong Kong. because I was playing rugby a lot of the time. So then I forgot about it. And then when I got to Hong Kong, I was committed to rugby, rugby, rugby. And I wanted, to, I really wanted to play for Hong Kong. It was like my desire because you only have to be living there for three years to get your, uh, like to be qualified. If that makes sense. Okay. It's pretty, it's pretty easy. So they can have expats playing. Anyway, I trained and trained and trained. And in my third year, when I just got eligible, I like, they picked a squad. It was the year before sevens was going into Olympics. So I was like, so I was playing for our premiership team and I was like, fuck, I really want this. And uh, they pick the squad down from like, whatever, 24 down to 15 or whatever. It goes less and less. And then they did, they give the shirt presentations. I got my Hong Kong jersey. I was like, fucking, this is awesome. First game, like not even a real like cap game. It was like Hong Kong against like a club. So they made a Hong Kong team against some club teams. I did my MCL, my ligament. Fuck. And I was just like, you know what? I'm done. I was like, I cannot keep putting myself at the hands of every other person because you know i was you like one anyone who knows plays rugby you know on a monday you feel like you've been hit by a bus mm. and it was just completely out of my hands and i was putting all this pressure on myself so i quit and um during my rehab i found a crossfit gym and believe it or not crossfit is way safer than rugby as far as i'm concerned i know everyone <laughs> says everyone's like oh crossfit you're gonna get injured what where you're in control of your entire body and everything yeah exactly oh yeah. uh, i don't think so it's just from what um, that was that. It's so stupid yeah and that was 2014 i think 2014 and so i just started at a small crossfit gym in hong kong called crossfit cavaliers and they're awesome they're still there very small family oriented gym mm -hmm. um and i just started training and i remember like i think my one rep max squat was like 80 kilos or something even it was like still that's a lot for for a most beginner women, but yeah. for a beginner that's a lot right but to me <clears> i was like because i'd already been training for rugby and you know i'd been doing strength and conditioning for oh, the last okay. kind of five or six years so i had this is the thing i had the the olympic lifting background because i learned how to do i did my uk sea olympic lifting certification when uh, i was at university so i had that i just didn't have the gymnastics or the engine Mm. And yeah, I just believe it or not, I was better at CrossFit than I was at rugby. I dare I say. <laughs> mm. Right. And then I got, um, yeah, I got introduced to this incredible sport where it's just you. Mm -hmm. It's you against you, and no one can help you. And if you fuck up, it is entirely your fault. And I thrived off that. Yeah. I was just like, wow, like I can just work as hard as I want and get these results or I can like choose to, you know, back off or, you know, suffer or, you know, feel sorry for myself. And it just started teaching me this incredibly, um, 
what's the word I would use? Just like robust mindset. Like I just yeah. started to develop this ability to, to deal with pain and it was just like hooked, immediately hooked, done. Yeah. It's more, it's so much more than just a training methodology, isn't it? Like oh. <laughs> that's, that's why I lo love it so much because it's, it's taught me so much more than just, you know, just getting fitter and, and leaner and, you know, mm. stronger. Like it's, it's all the mental stuff as well. So that side of it is just incredible. That's why I love it so much. It's, um, yeah, the, the actual workout. So the actual workout is like what, 15 minutes, 10 minutes. Like that is such a tiny percentage of what you get from joining a CrossFit gym and a CrossFit community. It is, you just immediately have reached to people who generally are like-minded. Like, like mm. I, I believe that if you are prepared to go and suffer willingly or go and, you know, work hard willingly, I won't say suffer because I don't believe that suffering is optional. Uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> mandatory. Um, yeah, yeah. What do I say? <laughs> Getting myself confused. I, you are with like-minded people that have decided, you know what? I know that this adversity is going to lead me to a better place and I'm going to yeah. learn how to, you know, overcome these challenges because it's fucking technical and it's, it's, it's like adult play. How cool is that? It's like a group of adults in a room just playing, throwing metal around. Mm, I know, right? Like one of people I'm that are pumping you up, you know, they want, they want as the best for you, you know, as much as you oh, want for you, you know. I've never seen a more, if you want like uplifting, go to a CrossFit in the last three minutes of a workout where there's like a one rep max attempt. You'll have fucking 50 people, go on, yeah, yeah, go on, Bobby. And then when you slam that bar down, it doesn't matter if your one rep max was three kilos or 300 kilos, you will get the exact same recognition because it's, exactly. your, it's you against you and it's your effort. And I freaking love it. Exactly. Fucking oath. Amen to that. Amen. Yeah. I mean, obviously it doesn't always go to plan, but most of the time, most of the time. Most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. Even if you fail, they're still going to um, congratulate you. Oh, of course. Because it's based on effort. Yeah. Not result. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So, um, so you started getting good at cross, crossy and then... Um, <laughs> What did you, like, Chrissy? I'm laughing at the the Aussie, the the Crossy, the the Arvo. Like I'm getting used to the lingo. Sorry, guys. I'm still learning how to change it into Australian. <laughs> I don't think many people say that though. I think that just came out. Um, so, um, so then, like, how did you? Because you made regionals, right? Mm, I made regionals as an individual in 2017. So for anybody listening that doesn't know CrossFit, um, basically CrossFit is a sport. It has become a sport and you, you can go and compete at the CrossFit games, which is like the world title. But well, this is the, the way that it used to be. Um, you used to have a, a regionals um, that you had to, that you had to kind of make the top five in um, to make it to the CrossFit games. So so you made the, the CrossFit regionals in 2017. Mm. Um, how how from long? From Asia. From, so you were... Uh, so I was in the Asia region. Asia region. So was that not um, Pacific? Either yeah. So what happens Asia is Pacific, right? they take the top 10 from Asia Pacific. Uh, sorry, they take the top 10 from Asia and then you come and compete against Asia Pacific in the regionals. Yeah, right. Okay. So... That was in um, Sydney. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was in Wollongong. Wollongong, yeah, cool. So, um, how many years was it like between starting CrossFit and then making to the regionals? I first started CrossFit in two thousand and fourteen, okay. and I can tell you, I was fucking shit. <laughs> <laughs> I've got, I've got videos of me coming, and I was working as a personal trainer. And I'm in the gym and um, I'm, I'm so tiny. Like my frame is like, I weigh like 60 kilos now and I was 48, 49 kilos in. So I put on like 10 kilos. Right. So real, like I was tiny. My arms were like sticking and I've got this 20 kilo barbell, which as you know, is like the men's empty weight. And I'm trying to hang snatch it. And I literally can't even hang snatch 20 kilos. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's incredible. But it's funny to look back and see that 
that transition. Yeah. And it's, it is without a doubt the most humbling sport you can do. Mm. Holy shimali. You, 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 every time you achieve something, you realize, wow, I have so far to go. Mm. As with everything in life, I'm sure, but 100%. CrossFit, it is just, it is never ending. And that gap now between the elite and the non-elite is just becoming even bigger. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And that's also another thing that I, I, I love about it. There's just so much that I love about it is that there's always something to work on, you know, like there's always something to achieve to get better at. And, mm. you know, it's not like just going into a gym and doing your bicep curls and your tricep extensions and your calf raises. Like, yeah. there's, you know, you can always get better at a technique. You can always get better at um, coordination. Yeah. Um, yeah everything like it's, it's like the 10,000 hour rule honestly I, I when I'm coaching people in the gym and I'm coaching Olympic lifting you know they'll they might learn how to do um, like a clean and jerk for example and they might get it once or twice once you've taught them and um, they're like Fuck, I've got it and you're like yeah now you've got to do 10,000 more repetitions until you're happy with it yeah. and they're like what and I'm like literally it is like never ending that the fine line is millimeters between a good lift and a failed lift and this is what it teaches it teaches you to be diligent and it teaches you to be patient it teaches you to be humble mm. and it teaches you that because it's it's so big you know the broad the, the training method is so broad now we cover you know olympics running swimming weightlifting it's just it's huge even now it's like you uh, bike track what is it bike trekking or what do you call it trail running, trail cycling running. off in the desert in Dubai. Yeah. It's ridiculous now. There's just never ending chasing for the lay people, shall we say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, where'd you place in regionals, if you don't mind me asking? I placed almost last place. I have yep. no shame in saying this. I actually think that I uh, made it to regionals through default. So. Oh. I say not diva. I'm not going to, no, no, I'm not going to disregard myself. So I was competing and they take the top 10 people from Asia. Yeah. And my Asia region had about 3000 women in it. So it's still difficult, you know, like it's Russia, Hong Kong, China, Philippines, whatever, whatever, all of that. Yeah. Region. It's a lot of people. I still have to be, I'm not going to disregard myself, but um, I actually came 11th when the places came in, but someone pulled out and went team. So they ah. sent me this email and I was like, Oh my God, this is fucking awesome. <laughs> Get like, the fuck out of here. Like literally, I'm like, holy shit. I'm going to be competing with like celebrity professional athletes. Like Cara Webb's leg is mm. the size of my waist. And I was like, this is cool <laughs> as hell. Like I honestly was like a, like a kid. I was like, fuck yes. I can't yeah. wait to do this. Yeah. I was terrified. And I knew when I got there, like my, my goal, I was working with Ed Haynes at the mm -hmm. time, who's a freaking awesome awesome coach i recommend him to anybody um and he works at coastal gym yeah coastal fitness performance in, in hong kong um he you know we basically looked at this opportunity and it was like look let's be honest probably not gonna make the game <laughs> <laughs> but you can learn and our goal was to not get disqualified because they had like minimal work requirements for each oh one. yeah yep so uh, and that was my goal and i did it i didn't get disqualified nice yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah. I do, I think I do there was... remember that because there's a few people because there was strict handstand push-ups in the in that first event. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it was the the run, the kipping, the strict handstand push-ups, and it was the, it was horrendous. And the yeah. wall balls. So it was the first year they added the high target for the women, and yeah. because they took a lot of women from the Asia region who have short, we just short. We just couldn't get through the wall balls. I, I I did lucky, but I think a few of the girls got eliminated on that because yeah, right. the required work rate was so, it was so tough. Hard. It was tough. Tough. Yeah, tough. Yeah. Tough. To this day, that moment when I ran out on the floor and looked up, it's one of my proudest moments. Like I, re I, re I go back to it and just think about all the sacrifice and hard work I put in to get there. Mm. It was just incredible. It really is. Your life just becomes you, you, it, it sounds, sounds odd because discipline does equal freedom for me. And once you set yourself that goal, it actually becomes easy to do all the things that you need to do to get there because they're just a non-negotiable. So yeah. I didn't drink for six months. You know, it's just a non-negotiable. Like that's it. And it's become yeah. so easy. Once you say no, you're like, eh, easy. Mm. 
That's it. I didn't, I didn't eat out for a long time. I carried my scales, you know, I had a full-time coach, nutrition coach, all of that. And it was just like, people would ask me, well, you know, don't you get, isn't it boring? Or don't you find it hard when you're eating out? I'm like, I just, just didn't do it. Like it was an unhealthy obsession, but if you want to be the best and you want to achieve it, that's what you've got to do sometimes. Cause I definitely believe discipline equals freedom. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's only, it was only a part of your life. It's not, you weren't, yeah. You know what I mean? You, you've moved on now. So it does, you know, it's not going to be unhealthy for your whole life. That's, that's the way that I I look at it anyway. Um, Exactly. So uh, we chatted on the phone the other day and um, basically you said that um, you had, had aspirations to make the CrossFit games and not too long after regionals, you had an accident. Is that right? Mm, I don't think I was going to make the CrossFit Games, but um, <laughs> I had aspirations. Aspirations, to, yeah. To continue, to continue to compete and perform because I was just so in love with the sport and yeah, I was excelling. And then I had an accident. Yeah, I had, um, I have an autoimmune disease called ankylosing spondylitis. It's essentially rheumatoid arthritis. And basically your immune system is overactive and it attacks itself. And it's all linked to your gut microbiome and what food you eat. And um, just managing chronic inflammation within the body. Oh. Because, yeah, because basically, so my immune system's on like overdrive all the time. So I can get ticked off by like one peanut will like throw me into chronic inflammation. And yeah. It's not, it's not good. So anyway, the way that it presents itself in ankylosing spondylitis is the connective tissues around your pelvis and your spine start to seize up. So you just, as you get older, it, there's not a cure currently at the moment. Um, you can take steroids daily, like in, in daily injectable steroids, but I've chosen to try and treat it with food and nutrition right now. Mm-hmm. But um, at the time I was obviously training, so I was under chronic fatigue and stress. I was just overtraining. I was still eating like three and a half thousand calories a day, but it just wasn't enough recovery. It wasn't enough sleep. And I just ignored them. I kept training and I was getting warning signs in my back and like it was getting stiff. And one day I caught a snatch overhead and I felt like something go in my back and um, my like left leg went numb and I had um, pins and needles and it was just whole shabam, as you can imagine, terrifying. Like if you've slipped a disc. So I went to the hospital, they did an MRI, and they're like, yeah, you fold your disc. It's pretty common in athletes, so it's not the end of the world. And I work in the this kind of field. So I was like, oh, it's okay, I'll rehab it. And when they did the MRI, they did an x-ray. Of course, they're not going to x-ray somebody who walks in. And, you know, I don't know why. Anyway, months went on, and it just wasn't getting better. In fact, it was getting worse to the point where I couldn't even get out of bed sometimes. I was in so much pain. I started to... Yeah, I couldn't train, my job couldn't coach. It was just decided to go downhill. And then one day I was in the gym and I was like, just just moving, like just trying to feel better. I'd taken a break. And um, I put the bar on my back to do a squat. And in the bottom of the squat, something just went like, just that was it, out of the blue. I felt fine before. It was just like sore and stiff occasionally, but I was managing it. And then when that happened, my whole left leg like went completely numb down the back and pins and needles and just terrifying. Like you can imagine, you're lying on your back and you're like, holy shit. So I went to hospital and they were like, "Uh, you've had three pars fractures, which is where, I don't want to butcher it, but the spinal processes, which is like your dinosaur spine to the back, had had intraticular pars fractures, which is where you get a fracture from the inside out. Um, they basically fractured all the way through. So I then fractured my spine and it dislocated and the bottom of my spine had slipped forwards about four millimeters, I think. And so that was it, it was surgery. That was the only option. So um, from that day, my whole life changed. It was a completely life-changing moment that I would never wish on anyone, but I'm so grateful for it happening because it put me on my trajectory of where I am today. Mm. Yeah, wow. So basically, did they say that you weren't allowed to train like you were or you kind of just thought? So, so they gave me a few options. They, you know what doctors are like? Well, I say orthopedic surgeons are like, they're very conservative. 
And, you know, I'm so grateful for the, for the doctors and physios that were around me. But I, to this day, I say, you know, what if it wasn't for me and my coach, Ed Haynes, and my mindset, I think I'd have been way more fucked right now if I'd listened to the doctors because the surgery was like, okay, we're going to operate through the back, which is where they cut through your erectus spinae, go in that way. And they put a, they actually took a bone graft from my hip and a cadaver, which they had to get from someone else. I don't know why they had to use two. <laughs> and they put a cage in between our four, our five S1, so two cages, and then three pins on one side, pins on the other side. Anyway, they were like, we're going to go through the back. And I was like, whoa, what are you going to cut through my spine? And they were like, well, you know, it's the easiest access for us. It makes the operation so uh, more, you know, straightforward. And I was like, well, what are the other options? They're like, well, like you can, they, they give me like a few options and I'd already been in Google this. So I was like, I fucking know. You can actually go through the front. So you can actually operate on your spine through anterior approach. Okay. And um, I'd gone on some like forums of some like Russian gymnasts, which were in Russia and I had to get someone to help me translate them. <laughs> um, <laughs> and they were like basically saying gymnasts had had similar issues who had also was struggling with ankylosing spondylitis, like same autoimmune disease and um, where the pars fractures happen. So you get a defect, you don't realize you've had the fracture. So you keep training. Then one day the spine just goes, which is essentially, it was like the straw that broke the camel's back with me, if that makes sense. Mm. And um, I was like, go through the front because I saw that it said your return to sport is way quicker. Like, cause you don't have to cut through any of the muscle tissue. When you go through the front, it's like having a C-section. They cut through the skin, then they cut through where like your, your abdominals would be, but it's like, um, it's not muscle tissue. It's like connective tissue. It's just like having a baby. And I was like, I want this approach. And um, they were like, uh, it's far more risky, blah, 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 more expensive, blah, blah, blah. I was like, I am going to return to sport and I'm going to go and be a regionals competitor. I'm going to go and crush all these goals. They thought I was fucking mad. <laughs> um, uh, but they agreed. They were like, fine, you know, if that's what you want, we'll do it. Uh, and even it's never it's never straight straightforward but um even the day of the surgery i went into surgery went down and i was sat on my bed at like 7 a.m and um, the surgeon comes into my cubicle if you can imagine this and there's like him and like seven other doctors around it like jesus christ what's going on now <laughs> chop my leg off what's happening yeah. and um, he's like he's like we've got a problem bobby i'm like oh fuck what He's like, someone who has had this procedure in a, in a different hospital has, they didn't, I don't know, I don't know if the patient like passed away or whatever, but they were like, look, we've had a, a major incident where someone's had this surgery through the front and it didn't go well and they had to like, they didn't tell me anymore. And they were like, so we're advising you to go through posterior entry. And they're like, you've got five minutes to decide. Here's our guidelines. You have to sign this waiver to say that you've agreed and all this stuff. And I was like, fuck. What am I going to do? Mm. It's like 7 a.m. My parents are asleep in the UK. I had my friend with me, Claire, one of my, my best friends. She took me to the hospital. And my, my friend Claire is an anesthetist. Luckily, thank God, she was an anesthetic anesthetist, anesthesiologist. Puts people to sleep. Oh, and yeah. um, and uh, I don't know. I just had this like calling. Like, you know what? I'm going to have faith in this doctor. I asked him, have you done this procedure before? He said, I've done six procedures. I've done two through the front. They've all been successful. I said, let's stick with the original plan. I'm like, I'm, you know, a woman who knows what she wants. So we did it. I signed. I was like, he was like, you know, that it's risky as I'm going to do it. Go in there. Two seconds later, you wake up. Feels like two seconds, five hours later. Mm -hmm. And then that's when the fucking rock, like, ball hit me in the face. And I was like, holy shit, this is not going to be easy. This is terrifying. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was the hardest, most challenging 18 months of my life hands down you 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 have no idea the challenges that just becoming debilitated can can bring on to someone who's been so athletic all of their life and, and even for anyone else i you know i, I can sympathize i can empathize with that now just having your freedom to move taken away from you is just never to be underestimated and and i now if anyone's thinking of you know surgery on their spine and it's not necessary or just really really reconsider and make sure that it's the last resort because it is terrifying <laughs> mm. so does it um are you limited to what you can do now after you've had the surgery so now i'm 73 years on i 
set myself goals that were huge. I think, you know, better to be, you know, shoot, was it shoot for the stars and miss? I don't know. Shoot anyway, for the stars and land uh, on the moon. Yeah, yeah, that's it. I, um, I set huge goals. As you can imagine, like week one, it was to even, well, I wasn't allowed to get out of bed. You're tied down to a bed for five days. It's ridiculous. You're not allowed uh, to move. You have, you have a catheter. You have a line in your stomach with drains. You can't go to the bathroom. You can't go to the toilet. Because they fused the spine, you just have to stay flat. So for three days, you're literally strapped to a bed. You're not allowed to move. It's terrible. They don't tell you. They didn't tell me this before. Anyway, it's terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> so, my, so I wake up and I'm like, fuck like worst pain your stomach's cut open there's drains everywhere i was like this is not what i expected this is really not what i expected this is... yeah and um oh. week one my goal was to get to the bathroom and back by myself that was week one and um i did i think i did it like six days after the operation you have to wear this huge corset like a metal corset so for the next three months which is fucking annoying it's like mm. a chastity belt trust me literally oh. it's <laughs> and you have to wear it um and so you know after leaving hospital and then going through all of the whole losing your athletic identity and becoming deprived i suffered from depression after that and yeah just it was horrendous um i went through ups and downs where i would become the ego would creep in and i would no 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 I can't, i'm only somebody if i'm an athlete and i'm only worth something if i have a six pack so i'm gonna i'm gonna push myself so hard and those little moments where I'd be in pain, but I'd just be like, no, look, you know, my ego, you can, you can do it. Just keep pushing, which I am horrified that I even thought that at the time mm. now. Yeah. So thankfully with Ed's guidance, we got myself after three months, I had my first session back in the gym, three months post-surgery. And I say gym session, it was lying on the floor wearing my brace still just doing belly breathing and just trying to get my shoulders moving and, you know, trying to, I still couldn't walk without pain. So it was, it was challenging, but I've now got to the point where I'm just respecting my body so much. And I respect my ability to move so much that I have, believe it or not, I train the least I've ever trained. Um, I'm just an alignment with what my body in the universe. And I now just understand what my body needs to feel good. And, and it's really difficult to say this to someone who's in that mindset of go, 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 more, 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 go, go, go. I have to be the best. And I'm only going to be worthy if I'm this lean machine. But um, there will be a teaching point for everybody, I think, or a transition point. And now I am limited, but I don't feel limited because what use have I got to go and deadlift 150 kilos? It's mm. not, it doesn't, you know, it just doesn't serve me. So yeah. what I do right now serves me and my mind and my body and my soul. And I'm, just unbelievably grateful that I've been given this opportunity to, to move again and, and appreciate my body. Mm. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, <clears throat> I can only imagine how like, yeah, how devastating it would have felt like having that taken away from you and, and being, and feeling like it's your whole identity being, you know, stripped away from you. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Be... It's like, I didn't, really understand grieving and this is mm. this is what i went through i had to grieve this old bobby and i had to embrace this new bobby and even to this day i've only understood this in the last 18 months i've mm. really had a huge transition personally in the last 18 months where i have just surrendered to all of that tension that i was holding and that negativity and that fear and that that resentment I had for other people who were still in the sport and I couldn't and jealousy and just even when I thought I was recovering and even when I thought that I'd dealt with this um uh what's the word like grieving of my athletic identity to become this new person even when I had embodied this new person it wasn't real it wasn't actually me who I am today completely content mm. and at a place of alignment and I just, I just, I'm so grateful. I, I have a tattoo on my arm, many tattoos, but um, this one in particular says, was I deceived or did a sable cloud turn forth her silver lining on the night? 
Mm. And it's it kind of where the, what I'm saying, you know, every cloud has a silver lining and it's mm. truly because I am really, I'm so grateful for that happening to me and allowing me to go on that journey. And my, my, my biggest lesson was this problem I had with my body image and my self-worth being linked to my opinion of my appearance. So it wasn't even what my appearance was because my appearance now fluctuates all the time, but I'm still in love with myself. So my self-worth stays. Whereas I think because of my exposure to this like elite performance world and having everything based on your performance and outcome goals, mm. I just became, I just became my whole self-worth and identity was attached to the way that I looked. Mm. And um, it was just, it's been constant work and that moment when I went into hospital of course I went and literally went from being you know I would say like a leader in the in the kind of industry Hong Kong is a small place so you kind of known quite well hmm. and um yeah they just it just went away I just became an I became what I thought was a nobody I would tell myself I'm just a nobody um you know, you're only somebody if you've got a six pack, you're only somebody if you're making gym videos on social media of doing snatching. And I, you can tell, you can see, if you look back through my social media, I was always posing in my sports bra. I would, I would take a picture and then I'd re, like repost to make sure my abs were on show. You know, like now I'm like, now I'm like, what the fuck was I doing? Like, that was, that is, that is, now I know you're, we are stuck. People are stuck in fear. Women are stuck in fear because they're just not in love with themselves and they don't have this contentment that you can reach, but like, it's, hmm. it's, you've got to do the work and it's hard. And I've had to go through that process of, I, honestly, I laugh. I would, I would say hundreds, like, you know, they say boyfriends, I'd be like tippy toe, just to get the right <laughs> angle. And I would, like, I would like scroll through my videos just to find the point where my abs are up. Yeah, that one. That one Screenshot like, that. Fucked. So, literally, that was it. How yeah. fucked is that? Like, that's what I used to base my self-worth on. So if mm. you, every single picture, and, and I, I, I never preach to anyone, and I, I believe that everyone is on their journey. When I go through social media now, and I, if I see women where every single photo is a picture of them, I, I send them love because I feel sorry. I think, hey, you've got some healing work to do because right now yeah. you're basing your self-work and seeking validation yeah. from that. And the hardest part is to, to recognize it. And, and that whole podcast we've spoken about and all that journey has got me to being the, where I am now. And this is, this is how I optimize people's mm. lives. I help them understand that you can actually truly be in love with yourself and you can truly be content with yourself. And it doesn't have to involve all of the external sources. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I do want to touch on a little bit of, of what you are doing now, but what, what helped you get through those really tough times? Who, who was there? Like who helped you? What did you have to do? Like you mentioned so, Ed, you mentioned Ed was here. Big, big part of that. Huge part. Ed Haynes. Um, I don't coach with him anymore, but he works remotely. I'm, I don't know if he's taken on any new clients, but um, terrible friend, just a great coach. Just let me know that. <laughs> He'll laugh I, if he hears that. I really like his stuff that he puts out on, on Instagram and everything. Yeah. Um, Ed Haynes. How do I sum him up as a coach? Oh, um, dedicated, knowledgeable, like unbelievably knowledgeable uh, and stubborn. But I think the best of people have to be stubborn. Yeah. He was my, he was my go to, you know, you need that person when you're unsure, you need someone to be your reassurance. Cause even as a coach myself, you know, I didn't, I didn't know what I was doing. So he was my, Hey, is this okay? Yep. Keep doing it. Uh, okay. Is this too much? Yep. Keep doing it. He, he just was definitely one of the solid people in my life at that time. Um, and then I honestly, I put it down to my mindset. I know, I know it might sound a bit the word is like it's preachy but in it i just in, you know they say that well how how did you do that how did you go through that but my response is well there's no other option like what, what what's the alternative to give up because mm. that's just never an option like mm. no giving up means you still got to wake up the next day and do the same like you might as well keep doing what you're doing 
or you can just give up and keep giving up and give up every single day until you realize, well, fuck, the only way out of this is for me to take responsibility. Mm. And so that whole process made me realize that I was living in this false environment around people that I didn't necessarily want to even be around. I actually took a step back from that CrossFit gym because I found, not because of Ed personally, but um, a lot of people in that environment for me were toxic because of the whole competitive validation. Like it just wasn't right for me. And I I have nothing negative to say about that gym ever. I think that's an awesome community. I highly recommend you going there. But just for me on my journey, I had to step away from that. Mm. And um, I would write on the wall what my goals were. And I would, what I thought was meditating. Now I realize I was just wishing I was meditating and passing the time and thinking, fuck, I wish it could end so I could go and eat something. <laughs> <laughs> that is so Literally, true. That is so it's true. like, well, because I did the traditional, I did what everyone thinks. So a lot of the, a lot of the practices that we see, you know, mindfulness and meditation and journaling, like there, there's nothing wrong with these. In fact, they're freaking awesome to get us to start being mindful and present mm. and being aware. Mm. But, if you're using them as a means to an end, which I was, I was using meditation to say, I'm being mindful, tick, done meditation. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm journaled today, tick, I've journaled. But what was I actually getting out of it? Apart from maybe like on a superficial level, not very much. And I didn't even realize until I went through some healing work and I realized that, holy shit, I wasn't, I was just blocked. I was blocked to receiving any guidance from the universe. I was blocked from being open to operating on a high frequency. I was just in low vibrations all the time. Thankfully, the one thing I learned from this, the biggest lesson was just not to be a victim. Like switch from victim to empowerment and it is the biggest switch you will ever make in your life. Because yeah. it it doesn't matter what you can tell me. Like you, a client could come to me and say, I've you know, been through abuse, I've been through trauma, I've had a you know, severe accident. It doesn't matter. The second that you take radical accountability, like radical accountability, you write out what you've been through and you release all of that shame and that embarrassment, whatever it is, and you just accept it and you forgive yourself. And you say, the only fucking person on this planet that can heal me and can fix me is me. The second you do that, your fucking life will change. Mm. That's it. Yeah. Because you can go to therapy for years. You can see accounts of it. You can cut. It doesn't matter. You have to take the responsibility. And when I was in that place with my back and I was getting pulled off into drugs and I was getting pulled off into people that I didn't want to be around and I was just negative and I was suffering with chronic inflammation. And, you know, I had all these people, Ed and my partner at the time, Ali, and these people around me and my, my, my current partner, Austin, who has been my absolute rock through all of this. He is the most incredible human being. I'm so grateful. Um, it, it, it's just the second you take that responsibility, it doesn't matter what anyone says to you. It doesn't matter how much you read or journal. It doesn't matter. It has to come internally and it has to come from a moment of surrender. When you just say, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not, I'm not going to beat my stuff up. I'm not going to do all this superficial shit like journal and meditate. And because trust me, the second you truly surrender, you get the answers. So if mm. you're not receiving those answers, if you're that person that's stuck in a place of I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. You've not, you've not actually done the work yet. There's still work to be done. And I just had that moment. Yeah. Two years. Well, when did I feel a year and a half ago, I guess when I was just coming out of my rehab process for my back and he was like, Hey, I don't have to be a victim anymore. And I just started making changes, huge changes. And that was it. Yeah. Sick. That's amazing. Um, there, it's definitely, uh, it's a massive thing. And I know because I used to be a bit of a victim as well. Um, but I just, I realized like through, through personal development, and everything, I realized that it doesn't serve. Um, it didn't serve me. Like I, I wanted yeah. to be, I wanted to be happy. And in order yeah. for me to be happy was to let go out of, let go of things that are out of my control and yeah and that that also looked like um stop you know complaining and blaming others for the way that yeah. my life is or what's happening in my life yeah 
Yeah, a lot of a lot of what we do is we we put the outcome before the feeling. So we say, well, if X happens, I'm going to be happy. So you're putting that outcome before the emotion, and that's playing mm. the victim because mm. you're saying, well, this thing needs to happen while I'm in this victim mode, and then once I receive this, or once I get this reward, like the ha- like the reward is like happy, whatever it is that you want then I'm going to change my emotions and be happy. But that's completely fucked. We've got it completely around the wrong way because you just need to choose. And I, and I, and I know some people really dispute this. They'll, they'll argue with me this. And I say, hey, you know, I just forgive them. And I say, you know what? But your time will come. I, tr- I truly believe because not a single person who I've spoken to who has, who has had this moment, never. you don't go back there once you've had this I don't know, awakening or awakening. moment or whatever. Yeah, whatever we call the singularity. There's this this point where you realize, holy shit, like, you know, I can just choose to be happy. And of course, shit happens. Mm. Well, you've, the, the point of this is you've got to have faith in it because you've got to believe in it before you see it to reap the benefits. There's got to be some risk, right? Nothing worth have, nothing ever worth having was was easy. So mm. you've got to take the risk of believing in it first. Totally. You know, there's, there's a saying, there's no, no outside source will, will save you from your internal unworthiness. And that's a really nice um, saying that I like to use. And, you know, it just kind of highlights that nothing internally is, that's sorry, nothing externally is going to help you because it has to come from within. Mm. Yeah, totally. Um, so were well, you were saying that you basically based your whole self-worth off, you know, being um, a competitive athlete, and also your abs and the way you looked and you know all that kind of stuff and yeah so so now how would you say that you um base your self-worth and um and you know you're like what yeah basically how would you how would you base your self-worth now i'm enough yeah that's it like i just am i'm just enough and I don't need to be anything more or anything less. And I know it's kind of a spiritual term that might get thrown around or I don't know, a bit cliche, but it's, and you have to mean it because you can say it. I was saying it for years. I was saying it on social media. I was like, I was one of those fake bitches, honestly, my first few years in Hong Kong. And I just did what I needed to do, but not intentionally. Mm. You're unaware. It's blissful Mm. ignorance when you're unaware. And I mean, you must have had that moment where you just like wake up and you're just like, oh, I actually feel this. Hmm. I actually feel this. And my partner has been huge in my journey because yeah. self-love is, is different to self-care. Self-care is go and have a fucking bubble bath. Like, trust me, that ain't going to fix your shit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, like you can have, you can have a million bubble baths, ain't going to fucking help. Yeah. <laughs> it's still going to, you know, yeah. you can lose some weight even. You can lose, you can lose weight. If you believe, if you think that losing weight is going to make you happy, mm. you got it wrong. You mm. got to be happy before you lose that weight. Otherwise, you aren't, that's only self care. Like just yeah. externally changing the way that you look, but true self worth, or self-love comes from changing internally. Mm. So I used to, for me, it was all linked. The beginning of this was all linked to my, my body image. Truly, I suffered for years. I, I, I spoke about it on, on my podcast recently about how I used to look in the mirror, and this is not too long ago, two years ago, and I was, to anyone else, shredded. Like six-pack, lean, like fucking lean, like under lean for a woman. And I would be disgusted by the way I looked. And I don't mean like body dysmorphia in a way, as in like I wasn't anorexic or I loved food. I never had binging issues. I wasn't, it's very hard. It was purely because I would see other women mm. who were bigger in size, but mm. I'd be like, fuck, she looks good. Mm. She looks beautiful. And it wasn't, it didn't matter what anyone else did. I never, it was never for anyone else. And anyone who's struggling with this will relate. It's only, it's like your opinion of yourself. So it mm. doesn't matter what anyone might say to you. It doesn't matter. I just was disgusted by my body image. And I just thought, how could anyone love me? How, mm. I remember going to a gym session with my partner, Austin. And uh, I think we, 
I don't know, we'd been out the weekend before or something or two weeks before. And so when you drink, you get inflammation. Of course, I suffer with chronic inflammation. So I really get inflammation. Like mm. I'll put on like two kilos in a day and my face puffs up and I get sore joints. And so I just look like water retention. And I remember coming into the gym and I just felt horrible and I was rolling and he was like, you look beautiful. And I, I, on, I wanted to punch him. I was so angry. Like, how can you not get, like, I just look revolting. <laughs> like, ugh. and it's so stupid. Like I see those pictures of me now and I'm like, you look fucking amazing. Yeah. Like amazing. You know, it's like, oh, it's crazy. I, so I, I started playing games. So one of the games that I always play or I share it with my clients, cause you've got to start somewhere. I know it, I know it has to come internally and that will come mm. with healing. But there are games that I play, which is basically the reflection game. So you will, every, you say like, right, for the next five days, every single time I see myself in a reflection. And I mean, every time, like car mirror, car door, you have to stop, you have to turn and you have to say something that you love about your body and you have to mean it. So it might be like, I really love my little finger. I love it. I love the way it looks. I like it. She's great. Because, because the magic happens in the feeling, the actual true believing that you can love yourself. So yeah. you can't fake it and be like, so I actually always loved my arms. I just, I've ne I just have, I think I've got great arms. So that's, that's just me. That's so I would just stand there and be like, I love my arms every day. I love my arms. And I'd look and I'd be like, well, there's fuck all else, but I love my arms. Yeah. And, that's it. <laughs> yeah. and it's, nope. it's, Go on. Oh, and it's that it's that connection to the emotion that you need to yeah. anchor on to. It's like, oh, I can love myself. Mm. I can love myself. And once you get that, that's the sweet spot because we can use that and we can manifest it into loads of other things. Yeah. Yeah, like this morning I was like, I was like, fuck, so I've still got a bit of love handles happening. But <laughs> fuck I love my earlobes. It's yeah. So nice. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> that's a good yeah, that could work. No, and I didn't, just harness I didn't, that I didn't love for that. your earlobes. I didn't do that. <laughs> okay. <but laughs> I guarantee yeah. next time you look at yourself I will. and you don't like your love hands, you're going to go, but fuck, I love my earlobes. Yeah. No, I actually, um, I started dry brushing. Um, have you heard of that? No. What is this? So you get this brush and it's a dry brush mm -hmm. and then you, you like um, brush your body and you start with your legs and you sort of work your way up your legs towards your heart. And then you sort of stop at your, your pelvis and then you do your arms and you always do it towards your heart. Um, and then you can do your face as well. And then you, and then you work down like your chest and then mm -hmm. up from your stomach into your heart region. And basically mm -hmm. there's a, there's a few benefits from it. Like one being exfoliating two, which is the main one. It's meant to uh, help, um, help with the lymphatic, um, What's it oh, lymphatic drainage. Yep. Yeah. Lymphatic drainage. Yep. So, and then, um, and also, yeah, just give you nice smooth skin, like, and, and release toxins yep. and stuff. So I started doing that, but that feels really nice. Like it's, it's dry. Ooh. And so it's quite coarse. So it's, it's pretty weird, but after you've done it, you, your skin kind of feels like it's not tingly, but you can. Dry you, brushing. Yeah. You kind of feel alive after it because you, you can actually just, feel your skin. Is this like a joint activity? Can you do this together or can you, you dry could, brush other people? You could dry brush your, your, <laughs> your, part, your partner's butt for him. Hey babe, fancy a dry sesh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. No. I was going to go somewhere again, but I thought I'll keep it. Um, you can cut that bit out if you need. Keep it, keep it out. No, I'm not cutting that out. But um, So yeah, it's... Uh, I, oh, or you know what's really funny is you could like leave it. Say you didn't like someone, like a girl, you could like brush your butt with it loads in your pubes, yeah, yeah. and then leave it in the bathroom. Like, just feel free to use the brush if you want. And she's gonna yeah. come out like <laughs> brush in there. Yeah, nice. Oh, it really makes my hair smooth. Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I use it on my face. <laughs> um, uh, so that's my sense of humor. <laughs> I like it. Um, so I can't remember what else I was going to talk to you about. Um, but I think we've covered some really good stuff. Um, yeah, yeah, a lot of stuff. And we are coming up. Yeah, we're, we're over the hour mark now. So I'll, I do like to keep them around the hour mark a little bit over. Mm -hmm. um, 
And of course, you know, we can always jump on again and do another one because yeah, everybody's awesome. got Definitely. fucking awesome stories. And um, Oh, man, I can literally talk the hind legs of a donkey. If that's, yeah. Is that a saying? That's a saying, yeah. Um, so if, if anybody is going through um, something similar that you went through, what would be one piece of advice? Sorry, not what you were going through, but what you, what you did go through. Mm-hmm. What would be one piece of advice you'd give them? Mm, one piece of advice. Honestly, you you need to speak to someone who can help you, who knows what they're doing. If you, if you really want true advice, like if if you need to heal trauma, speak to someone who can help you heal trauma. If you need to deal with body image issues, like find a coach that suits you. Like. No, I don't, I'm not saying pick me. That's not what I'm saying here, but I'm saying there are coaches for everybody out there and it's very difficult to do this on your own. You can, if you want, you want to go through this journey. But for me, I've had coaches all along. I've had a life coach. I've had a physical nutrition coach. I've had a gym coach. More importantly, since, since coming to Australia, I've had a coach who's helped me with my trauma and she's been freaking awesome. Mm. And um, you, you need to have, like you can't go into it blind yeah. because it's gonna, it's like, you might think you're getting the, the, the work. You might think you're healing. You might think you're understanding what your issues are, your insecurities, but it's so much deeper than that. And someone's going to have to make you feel uncomfortable because it's not easy. You, you really have to look internally and realize, okay, what am I hiding? What am I ashamed that I don't want the whole world to know about? What makes me feel so insecure that you're like, Oh, like, that's where you've got to go. That is literally where you've got to go if you want to get through what you're dealing with and what you're trying to heal. And it could be as little, it could be like, I say not as little, it could be like a shopping addiction. It could be trauma. It could be like, it could be anything. It could be that you're unable to communicate with your partner. Mm. We do a lot of work with couples and relationship coaching because, you know, that's something that's huge at the moment with, with modern day relationships, not being able to communicate. Mm. Um, but it doesn't matter what it is. To you, to you, it's blocking you. And it's to you, it's this something that's in the way of you achieving what you want to achieve. And unless you are prepared, so I'll say, unless you are truly prepared to do this, don't even fucking bother. Like, just keep doing, just keep cruising through life and pretend blissfully unaware that you're okay. But if you're hearing this and you're like, fuck, there's something, there's something I know I need to work on, like, go and do it. And the way that I'd say start is write down your story. Write down your story. Everyone's story makes them. Like this is one of the first things I do with my clients is I get them to write down what made them them. Every everything they're embarrassed of, every shame, everything they've done wrong, everything that you don't want the world to know. You've got to be prepared to put this on paper and overcome it and say, I don't fucking care anymore. Like mm. everything you've done wrong, taking drugs, being like whatever it might be, like being embarrassed, getting fired, like it doesn't matter. You've got to be prepared to write it all down have it in front of you. You don't have to share it with the world, but you need to say it and mm. believe it and understand that you, you have done this. And normally you need a coach to help you do that. So I'd say, yeah, one, make sure you're actually ready because it's fucking hard. And two, go and find someone to help you do it. Awesome. That was really good. Thanks, Bobby. Um, Thanks, buddy. Also, just a couple of finishing questions. Oh, I like questions. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Do you have a morning routine? And if you do, what does it look like? Oh, I've had the same morning routine for ages. It's called Savers, S-A-V-E-R-S. Is that out of that book? Yes. Did you read it? I just, I haven't read it, but I've just, I've just heard about it. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's fucking awesome. So I actually turned mine into M Savers because M stands for make the bed. And I think you should make the bed first thing in the morning. Oh, nice. Nice. Okay, so this art, do you want me to explain it, how it goes? Yeah, uh, yep, The saver stands for silence, affirmations, visualizations, exercise, reading, and scribe. And you can, you can turn that into anything you want. So I've been doing this for like six years, and I yeah. pretty much do it every single day in some way, shape, or form. But um, yeah, I picked up this book, yeah, six years. I found it in the gym, the first gym I worked at in Hong Kong. So, when I, oh, so okay. longer than that, eight years ago, maybe. Um, silence can be your meditation practice. For me, it's, it's actually 
my meditation is me writing my poems because it's the only time that I switch off from the universe. So that's just my meditation, but it can be breathing. It can be using headspace, whatever silence is. And you yeah. can do one minute on each or you can do 20 minutes on each, whatever time you're allowed, whatever time, whatever time you have. So silence, um, affirmations, S A is you write down your affirmations or you say your affirmations. For me, that's reading my prayers out loud or mm -hmm. reading my, so when I record them, you've seen me record them. That's like the second time. I've actually done them properly in the morning for me in my, in my Zen mode. And then I yeah. record them for you guys later on. Um, but affirmations, you can just write down your affirmations for the day. Your visualizations, which are so important because believe it or not, I have had the exact same visualization for six years. And I picked one and I just visualized the same thing over and over again. And not much has changed from it. And I still picture it every single day. And I just, that's me manifesting it to happen. Um, what, is it? what is it? What is it? Oh, I can share it. No, of course, that's me. So I don't know where I am. This is me. I'm walking out the door and I've got a pram and I've got a little boy in the pram and then I've got a little boy next to the pram and he's got long curly hair. He's got to have curly hair. I've always wear boys with curly hair. Not hair. And I'm wearing... <laughs> does Ozzy have, have curly Lulu. hair? Yeah, he's got curly hair. Oh, no, he doesn't have curly hair. But oh. I've got quite curly hair. Yeah, okay. Um, I've got... The pram's like a cool pram, like McLaren pram or something. Yeah. Anyway. Well, it is relevant because my visualization is so detailed because I've been doing it every year for the last six years. And then I'm leaving my house and my house is, I don't know where the house is, but it's got like open plan, barn conversion, pine, middle kitchen, island. And I'm running down the road with my kids to go to the gym, which I am either working in or running or I own or it's a wellness clinic and I'm wearing nice brand new Lululemon gear. Not that I'm materialistic, but this is just my visualization. And we've got a, a tan dog Jim and Bissler with me and I'm going to go meet meet who the kid's father is I haven't, I haven't really added that to the thing because I don't want to jinx who my kid's fathers are but um <laughs> I've been visualizing that for the same thing and that's what I visualize yeah so I visualize Sick. my future that's me when I, and I'm and the really important part is I'm smiling and I'm happy and I'm content and I'm walking down mm. the road so I live obviously close to my gym because I'm walking so wherever that is I don't know mm. And then exercise. For exercise for me, because I train a lot anyway, I don't exercise in the morning, but I just stretch. I'll literally just do like my car, shoulder cars or something. Oh, yeah. And then reading, I go back and read my journal from the day before. So I go back and read like yesterday's entry and then scribe is a journal. I write yeah. something, whatever's yeah. on my mind. So yeah, M savers is my morning routine. And when you wake up, water, salt, lemon, like before anything else, massive pint, chug it, get it down. Himalayan? Game hmm? Himalayan? Yeah, Himalayan. Yeah, Himalayan pink sea salt. Um, I did do the cold shower thing for a while, but not for me, that. <laughs> <laughs> Too cold? Oh, I'd, I'd start like resenting it. I'd start being like, it would start making me not want to get out of bed. I'm like, fuck, I just got chilled. Yeah. But I think that's like, the point, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, what case it's supposed to build mental <laughs> toughness, right? Yeah. But, um, I just end up being a bitch and then I just feel like I'll have a bath. I have a bath today. Easy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. Okay. Well, the cold so, yeah, showers, the cold showers were like giving you bad memories, like flashbacks to the UK because it's so cold. in Yes. The honestly, I've, I've got to let you into a secret. I get angry at cold. Like I don't, I don't do cold. It makes me like, I don't get it. I'm just like, what? I don't, I hate it. It makes me yeah. angry. I'm not interested yeah. in ever being ever cold. Like, no. Skiing um, is not a fun, like it, skiing can get pretty miserable. Unless I've got like mittens on, I'm not, I'm not moving. Yeah. Like I can't take them off ever. I'm like, nah, not interested. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's it. Um, all right. So last question. Okay. Shoot. Are you currently reading a book? I am reading a book. Yeah. I mean, two books. You're reading two books. Okay. Yeah. So the one that you're enjoying the most, Ooh. If, if you, I mean, if you are enjoying it, but the one that you are enjoying the most, what is a, what's the best lesson you've learned from it? Oh, well, interestingly, I'm reading Genghis Khan. Don't know what that means. 
So Genghis Khan was the Mongolian leader from back in 18, no, 18, 1200, 1200s. And he is, in theory, the world's most impressive conqueror. He conquered the whole of the world. And the fact is that one eighth of us all have Genghis Khan and he basically populated like the whole world. Yeah, oh, he's gosh. like fucking insane. It's a true story. So he was like from this Mongolian tribe and he had to go through the most torture like he got like tied to a horse and dragged along a rope for like days put in a toilet pit mm. then he had to hide under ice for 12 hours like the worst most unfathomable things you can imagine and then he became this emperor and conquered the whole of mongolia he invaded china he also murdered loads of innocent people so it's mm, peaks and troughs but, but big into pillaging not great but the, <laughs> the underlying lessons are really incredible because he basically came from nothing and it's teaching him about, he learns like respect and how to never, how to like never show weakness. And, but then he starts to learn as he gets older, he starts to show his vulnerable side and actually, it actually helps him improve as a leader. So we go through this like learning trends. I'm on the third book. So mm. there's three books. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. This is my book that me and Austin read. I don't, I think I said this, me and my partner have one book and we read it together so we only one of us can read and we read it out loud to the other person oh really so yeah so that's our that's our that's our book at the moment it's genghis khan we're on the third one it's called like i don't know we have to look that's it cool. up anyway yeah that's, that's cool book. that's awesome um cool book for young guys to read definitely oh yeah sweet um all righty so is there anything that you would like to plug and you know where can where can people plug oh i mean I don't really like plugging, but I do want to share that if you've got a gift, you should put it out there. And I believe that I have a gift. So you can just find me at my website, which is builtwithbobby.com. Um, it's still got like under some construction. So bear with it if something doesn't work, but it should be good. Yeah, builtwithbobby.com. And then my Instagram handle, which is builtwithbobby, but I think there's underscores in between it, built underscore with Bobby. And you can just find all my content on there, all my programs. Um, me and my partner have a podcast called The Feelings yeah. Meeting. Um, we are really um, passionate about helping modern couples have conversations that most couples are not having. Not having So mm. sex, finances. Basically, like, it's fucking tough to have a solid long-term relationship in 2020 because there's just an abundance of other people and stuff and distractions. And we've all got money and stuff and things going on. So it's actually really hard. Yeah. So yeah, that podcast is to help help those guys. And we don't know um, how to, and we don't know how to fucking connect to each other. Yeah, That's, well, it wasn't isn't like we're the most connected we've ever been and yet we've got the highest levels of loneliness and suicide through loneliness. That's ridiculous. Yeah. 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 So in fact you you one of the first reasons I connected with you was I saw one of your posts where you were really vulnerable and you you showed yourself having a bad day and I was like I actually sent your stuff to my partner. I was like, babe look at this guy this is amazing you're all just gonna cry together i love it <laughs> i literally did that and yeah. i sent him a picture of you and then i looked at him and i was like don't you dare say he looks like a pussy don't you dare say he looks like a pussy he didn't by the way he would never do that he'd never do that but i was yeah. like if he dares say anything about your you being vulnerable i'm gonna flip but if he, didn't. Yeah, like, if oh, he said yeah, that if he said that i would be surprised that you're with him no exactly he would never yeah. do that yeah um but yeah, that's one. That was interesting. That was one of the first times I like really went onto your site and looked at what you're doing, and I was like, "Fuck, this guy's cool." Yeah, it was so fucking random. I was like, "Yeah, yeah, just anyway, we really we know the story. Everybody else doesn't need to hear it." But yeah, Instagram is good for that, and social media yeah, is good Instagram's, for that. Connecting with people. Honestly, people are like anti Instagram. I'm like, guys you have a choice who you follow. Like you don't, yeah. you, you don't have to follow these people that are making you feel insecure. You can mm. choose not to. Yeah. I've been doing a cull, I spoke to you, I've been doing a cull every week trying to get rid of them, but it's fucking difficult. They make it hard to unfollow people, don't they? Oh, fuck yeah, 100%. Um, and for anyone listening, I, I deleted all my oh. followers, not my following, but everyone that I followed because I found myself on it too much. And mm. um, I kind of wanted to experiment and see what would happen. I didn't really have an intention behind it apart mm. from the experiment of seeing what would happen. And um, it's been, I think over a week now and yeah. I've noticed less time on Instagram scrolling. And yeah. also I'm 
I'm doing a lot more. So I'm taking a lot more action. Yeah. Um, and a lot of the stuff that I look at on Instagram is the self-help and personal growth and everything. So I'm always yeah. like trying to learn something new about myself. But this year has been more about being and mm-hmm. taking action. So instead of learning, like I still want to learn about stuff, but I don't want to be looking at Instagram posts every day being like, oh yeah, that's right. You know, like that's what I have wrong with me and I need to work on that. Oh, yeah, that's another, it's like, that's another thing. Do you know what I mean? It's like you're choosing the content you take in now, right? That's, that's what I was talking about. Like yeah. it's the same with, like, at the moment we've become slave. I was just, so I'll be out of time. Sorry. I was just speaking to my client this morning. And he has this awesome theory where he says humanism has outpaced Darwinism. He's a fucking awesome client. Basically saying like, obviously Darwinism, the evolution of humans, but humans have outpaced that. And now we are like, it's, we have too good for our, too good for our own, too good for our own good. Is that it? So basically like, you know, we, you can't, you can't survive without a phone, but your phone just brings you a load of shit and grief. Right? Yeah. You can't see, you can't have a good job without a car, but then if you get a car, you got to fucking pay taxes and fuel and all this shit. And it's just, same with like our phones, like it's all cool. Yeah. But at the end of the day, if you're a slave to it, then you're not cool. So go and delete all the shit that you shouldn't be consuming. And if you if you're scared, oh fuck, if you're scared to do that, then you're living in fear, and you need to deal with this and have like do some inward work on why, yeah, why you're probably doing that. Exactly. So like, oh, oh, if anyone wants to speak with me, hmm. I do like 15 minute chemistry calls. Um, they're just short 50 minutes. They're free. You can like book them in on my website or just chuck me an email. And, um, it's just like this. We just chat and I see, you know, if you're ready to do the work, cause quite often a lot of people aren't ready yep. and, um, yeah, that's it. It's been awesome. awesome. Beautiful. Thanks for coming on Bobby. Thanks buddy. And that's a wrap.